and welcome to the Alliance for Democracies, the Populist Dialogues. This Populist Dialogues Cablecast program's purpose is to advance the mission of the Alliance for Democracy to create a true democracy and a just society. I'm your host, David Delk. Our guest today is Jason Kafori. Jason is a trial lawyer here in Portland and an organizer with the Oregon Progressive Party. So welcome to the show, Jason. Thanks, David, for having me. Good, good. Uh, so uh, we've had a couple of other people uh, on the show uh, from the P Progressive Party. Tell me why the Progressive Party exists. Well, I think it's pretty clear, and we're seeing this more and more from voters, that they're dissatisfied with just two political options, Democrats and Republicans. Uh, there have been historically many third parties that have pushed the two major parties to take better positions uh, and have been able to um, really bring a lot of issues um, that weren't being discussed by the two major parties uh, to the forefront uh, of America's you know, consciousness. And the Oregon Progressive Party started off actually in 2008 as the Peace Party. Uh, and Ralph Nader uh, was its presidential nominee. After that election, that was at the height of Afghanistan and Iraq, uh, the organizers of the Peace Party realized we wanted to have uh, a, a more, a vision that included uh, peace and justice issues, but also looked at some economic, uh, you know, populist issues. And so we came up with the Progressive Party uh, obviously, there's a, a long history, uh, Progressive Party, dating back you know, 100 years. Mm -hmm. uh, and we have been uh, you know, fighting on a whole variety of civil liberties issues, stuff we're going to talk about today. Uh, and we have uh, at progparty.org, P-R-O-G-P-A-R-T-Y.org, anyone who'd like to take a look at our platform. We have a very clear uh, where we stand and where the Democrats and Republicans stand. We have about 15 or 16 issues where awesome. we're on one side and they're on the other. Okay. So, Great. yeah. So you mentioned Ralph Nader. Yeah. Uh, he was probably uh, well. He was certainly well known for uh, saying that the Democrats and Republicans are two heads of the same of the same uh, corporate uh, corporate party. state. Yeah. Yes, uh, right. Yeah. yeah. Uh, do, do you share that vision? You know, we do at the Progressive Party, and I, I do personally. Uh, I think that both Democrats and Republicans are so entrenched with money. Uh, and you know, as we've seen this huge uh, increase between, you know, gap between the rich and the poor uh, over the last 30 years, really since the Reagan era, what we've seen is that, you know, average people don't have a voice at the state level, the national level. And the big corporate interests basically run both political parties. Mm -hmm. So if folks want uh, to have, you know, a fair shot, uh, they sometimes have to go to third parties mm -hmm. to find people that will stand with them on issues they care about. Mm -hmm. So would, would you say the Democrats or Republicans, even though they seem to be at loggerheads uh, and can't actually pass any legislation in Congress, uh, but still they have some common interests that actually unite them? Yeah, I mean, I think anytime you're taking, it, you have to have money to, to be involved with politics to run for campaigns. That's clear. But anytime you're taking the same money from the same Wall Street, Wall Street guys, the same pharmaceutical industries, the same high tech uh, industries, and they're writing checks to both political parties, you know, both political parties are going to be somewhat entrenched to those those interests, mm -hmm. and that's what we have happening in this country mm -hmm. now. There is though. A really, you know, we'll talk more about this today, but there's a really interesting uh, streak where you've seen this libertarian wing of the Republican Party starting to buck some of the Republican establishment on certain civil liberties issues. And then you've seen, similarly, uh, on the Democratic side, some of the more progressive members are starting to buck the establishment on some of these civil liberty uh -huh. issues. And so those two uh, bucking factors, yeah. are, are they... Uh, going in opposite directions or are they coming together? Interesting, I, you know, I've thought a lot about this over the years. What are the issues that sort of left, right, the, on the far ends that people uh, can agree on? And not wanting, not trusting the government uh, in terms of spying on citizens, uh, in terms of the Patriot Act, uh, you know, warrantless uh, uh, wiretapping, all that kind of stuff. Um, I think causes 
uh, legitimate uh, paranoia uh, from the far left and the far right. Mm -hmm. uh, and, 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 but it, what the shared interest there is a distrust in the governing uh, body and you know all of our spy agencies um, you know since 9-11 we've just been spending billions and billions of dollars on the NSA and all these entities that now we're finding out are basically doing mm -hmm. you know legalized spying and with unlimited amounts of data the NSA is the National Security Agency right okay well, they, they, their budget has ballooned since 9-11, and both the Democrats and Republicans uh, at Capitol Hill are scared to vote against anything involving funding because they don't want to be thought of as, you know, anti-terrorist or, uh, you know, against our national security. So we're dumping, you know, billions and billions, and it's incredibly secretive. If it uh -huh. wasn't for uh, Mr. Snowden and his coming forward over the last couple months, to blow the whistle on what's really happening at the NSA, we citizens would have had no idea that every one of our cell phone calls, every one of our landline calls, every one of our emails have just been stockpiled by the government into huge databases. Mm -hmm. um, and you know, what they're doing with it, we really don't know. Mm -hmm. Yeah, is there, is there a uh, constitutional reason uh, why we should be concerned? I mean, I, I, I understand on a personal uh, yeah. level, but are there uh, constitutional ramifications for that? Well, you know, the the Fourth Amendment provides against search and seizure, and I think that um, you know we have obviously the Bill of Rights has been there for two hundred and fifty years, but you know we have a certain level of constitutional protection against the government just casting a wide net and, and and taking all of our personal information. And you know, courts historically uh, have been pretty good on civil liberties issues. Uh, but what we have now is Congress created the FISA court. And the FISA court uh, is a secret entity. Their opinions uh, are, are not you know disclosed. And that's where when the government wants to you know, spy on an individual citizen or uh, look at some uh, uh, foreign national, uh, that's where they go to get their warrants. And I think I saw, it's been like 1,700 or something last year uh, where they went to, to FISA to get such warrants and every single one of them has been approved. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, there's clearly just some rubber stamping. Going were, these, on. Were, were these warrants for specific individuals or were they just general warrants well, <laughs> that they were uh, like casting a well, broad net? What we now know, what we've learned, is that the, uh, the spy agency, the NSA, um, has gone to the cellular companies, the internet companies, your email companies, and they've actually gotten orders from the FISA court unbeknownst to, uh, to, to the public when it happened, they got orders that told those companies they had to, under a court order, give all this data uh, to the government. So it's not just about individuals anymore. Um, mm -hmm. They have all mm -hmm. the data. And uh, Glenn Greenwald's really been quite a hero uh, on this in terms of breaking the story and working with Snowden to, to, to tell the story. And he's not afraid of anybody. Uh, you know, read his columns. He does a mm -hmm. almost daily column uh, on all this stuff. But he was on uh, the, t the Today Show uh, with Stephanopoulos and this morning. And he said, and he's going to testify this Wednesday uh, uh, at Congress on this, Against the you know with the NSA people there, so it should be a fascinating debate. But he said that just like you'd have at a Safeway you know checkout stand, they at the low level you know lowest level of folks at the NSA, uh, they have a, a database and they can type in your email address, and anybody who wanted to that worked at the NSA could find out everything that you're doing, and mm. that's pretty scary. Yeah, that is pretty scary. That is very scary. Now the yeah. NSA is denying it. Uh, and they had uh, the, one of the senators, uh, I think it was uh, Chambliss from, uh, from Georgia, said, oh, no, I've toured there, and that's not true. They don't have that kind of access. <laughs> he said, oh, they used to have that access two or three years ago. Uh, right. Uh, but no, they don't have that kind of access anymore. Right. So, uh, but what's clear. Certainly no reason to believe that. <laughs> I, <laughs> yeah, I, you know, and, and uh, uh, one of the uh, NSA guys 
directly lied to Congress about this a few months back and you know said that, that, that they weren't collecting all this data mm -hmm. you know where's the outrage at, at, at Capitol Hill uh, mm -hmm. from members of Congress why aren't members of Congress saying that he should be pr you know, prosecuted for perjury mm -hmm. I mean that's yeah. well the outrage seems to all be reserved for Snowden <laughs> it's, uh, it's amazing right, uh, yeah, uh -huh. yeah it's amazing right. I mean you know Snowden whatever you may think of him personally uh, you know, he and Bradley Manning have brought to light more about the inner workings of our government than anybody within our government, mm -hmm. uh, really, in the last 10 years. Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah but, but, of course, uh, those who are attacking both of those individuals would say that they are giving aid to the enemy and decreasing the security that we have a right to feel. Well, I think that as a citizen, one's duty, first and foremost, uh, is to the Constitution. And if, uh, if those individuals thought that this information should be part of the public discourse, um, sure, the government is going to come up with, well, this person in such and such a country, we found some information that Mr. Manning had posted on the Internet through WikiLeaks, and therefore he's aiding and abetting the enemy. Um, but I think that you know, any time a journalist writes a news story where they have an internal source from the Pentagon reporting something about what's really happening with the Pentagon with our drones program, mm -hmm. for example. I mean, anybody could be prosecuted along those lines if that news story, once it became in the public domain, was found on you know a cell phone or a, or, or a, a, a computer in Afghanistan right. somewhere, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, there's no end to it if we start going mm -hmm. down that route. Right. Yeah. But but there are people who are willing to go down that route. Absolutely. Absolutely. And and. And it'll be really interesting to see what happens uh, with Mr. Snowden. Obviously, he's holed up uh, in, in the Russian airport at the moment. Mm -hmm. uh, I know that he's asked for asylum from uh, a couple different countries, including in Central and, and South America. Uh, and everything's pretty much in flux. I saw there was a recent letter um, that uh, uh, Putin sent uh, to, to the U.S. and Holder sent him a letter back saying, oh, we're not going to kill um, Snowden. Uh, yes, right, yes. <laughs> We promised not to kill him or torture him. That was that was basically <laughs> yes, the essence right, yes. of the of the yes, letter. Yes, we wouldn't torture anybody. Yeah, not the right. United States. Yeah, <laughs> right. So you know, I, all of this stuff is feeding a huge level of mistrust, you know, distrust in our government, um, mm -hmm. and, and I think that's why you're seeing people breaking away from the two established political parties more and more. Mm -hmm. And and you know, look at the uh, the independent party here in Oregon, for example. I mean, they have something like 90,000 registered voters or mm -hmm. close to that now. Um, you know, they're almost a major political mm -hmm. party. Uh, the Progressive Party, uh, we um, have stayed small, but part of that's for a reason, uh, because if you're a small political party, you, you have a lot of agility to, to, to move on issues quickly. Mm -hmm. You know, you can hold demonstrations and protests. You don't have to go through, um, you know, a bureaucratic thousands structure. and thousands of right. people uh -huh. through a bureaucratic structure to right. get decisions uh -huh. made. Yes, so. right. Okay. Yeah, I, and I, I have experienced that myself with the Democratic Party and trying to get you know a, a local Democratic county chapter to to do something. And it's it's uh, they got to report rare, up to the state uh, Democratic yeah, yes, Party, uh, right, and then the yeah. state Democratic Party says, right, "Well, is this right. in the good interest?" Of uh, yeah. Blah blah blah. Right. So. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So uh, you mentioned drones. Yeah. Uh, talk about uh, the danger that drones present. Uh, both as a foreign policy um, uh, mechanism and, and domestically. Right. Well, we have, let's take a little history on this. Uh, you know, over, how's it only been five or seven years probably uh, that drones have now become our primary uh, battlefield, uh, you know, in, in this never ending war on terror. They become our, our primary uh, way to combat war. Uh, and that's because Americans don't like it when Americans die uh, abroad. But if we can have an unmanned drone, uh, I had a, a, a colleague I, I knew who, he got paid $60,000 uh, for a six-month session to fly drones in Afghanistan. Uh, you know, and so you're, you're paying a huge amount of money for people to operate a drone in a foreign country and you know, we really have not created much rules about how mm -hmm. drones uh, can work in foreign countries. And what happens? Well, drones d can't always kill supposedly the bad guys out there. So there's been you know, horrific uh, incidents of you know, a wedding happening on a hillside in Pakistan and 
there's a miscommunication and a drone, you know, blows up people within the wedding. And mm -hmm. you know, stuff like that yeah, has well. happened um, uh, over the last few years. And it's really scary. Uh, you know, the concept that an unmanned, you know, robotic device could be hovering, you know, way up at, a, at an altitude that you could never see it. And you could be sipping coffee somewhere, and if somebody wanted to annihilate you, they could just press a button. I mean, that's a really scary concept. Right. Yeah, yeah, it is. And that actually is just about what happened with a couple of American citizens in Yemen. Yeah. That we targeted. Yeah. Right. A exactly. Uh, you know, speaking of the Constitution, uh, you know, the, the Obama administration has been as bad, or maybe even worse, on some of the civil liberties. You know. Assassinations of citizens across the you know across the world, um, they they have this sort of mantra that you know as long as you know it's under the global guise of the war on terror and these people are enemy combatants even if they're citizens, mm -hmm. um, they have a right to to shoot to kill and that's a pretty scary concept, mm -hmm. uh, uh, you know, especially if down the road. Uh, as drones get more and more uh, publicly available, um, they start to do it here in the U.S. I mean, that's yeah. things happen in stages. Right now, we're on the you know, they're using them in Afghanistan and Pakistan and Yemen and other places. Mm -hmm. But sometime in, in, in the near future, they're going to see someone who they think is a threat here in the U.S. and they're going to shoot him with a drone. And that's right. it's going to cause an uproar, but it's it's well, coming. Uh, yeah, and, and well, and the other thing is, a, a couple of weeks ago, I saw an advertisement in the in the Fred Meyer uh, uh, store ad uh, for a small personal uh, home drone uh, that you could buy for about two hundred dollars, or well, I forget what the price was, but uh, so it's a home, a home drone to fly within your home or to fly no, to fly wherever you want to fly it. Uh, wow. <laughs> yeah. Well. This gets uh, back. It wasn't armed, of course. <laughs> but <laughs> well, this gets back to what the the Oregon Progressive Party has been, you know, fighting for over the last couple of years. You know, ever since the the drone technology, um, uh, you know, became sort of ubiquitous as part of our foreign uh, military, uh, uh, you know, plan. What we've seen is now the FAA here in the United States is starting to provide licenses to law enforcement entities, uh, other public uh, entities, uh, to fly drones. Mm -hmm. And there's been a, a, a huge uptick in you know, public entities. I think the Clackamas County Sh uh, Sheriff's Office actually asked uh, to get uh, a permit to be able to fly drones recently. So what we did as the Oregon Progressive Party is we started here in Portland uh, and we went to the city council about a year ago and and ask them to, to make a local ordinance uh, banning drones for public or private use. You know, what I never get out of the debate about drones is what's the, what's the underlying public purpose for a private citizen flying a drone? I mean, wh what is that doing to, to better our society? I can think of a whole bunch of problems uh, that could come out of it. Uh, but I, I can't I can't see the public benefit in a private citizen flying a drone that has the ability to spy on others with cameras. I just mm -hmm. and, and obviously a weaponized one's even worse. Uh, yeah, but, right. Yeah. Uh -huh, but right. I, I it doesn't make sense to me. Right. But there are there are no regulations about the use of drones in the United States at this point, uh, other than uh, they can't be aimed at at commercial or military aircraft. It, it, it's a whole new world. And, you know, one thing um, that we saw here in the, in the Oregon legislature, uh, there, there, there have been a lot of efforts, local ordinance efforts, like we tried here in Portland, uh, to ban, you know, private, some, some have been to ban private, some have uh, been to ban, you know, governmental law enforcement agencies from using drones. Uh, but what we see uh, here in Oregon is the Oregon legislature in this last session Basically, instead of banning drones, private or public, they sort of came up with a, a huge laundry list of ways to regulate drones, as if the legislature was saying, well, drones are inevitable uh, here in Oregon, so mm -hmm. we might as well start to get some regulatory guidelines for them. And uh, you know, I, I went through a couple of things that I thought were, were important about the bill. Uh, we at the Oregon Progressive Party have started to put pressure on 
uh, Governor Kitzhaber to veto the bill. So it's not law yet, but it has passed both the House and the Senate. Uh, but, you know, number one, there, as part of the state law that passed, there's a preemption. State law, the legislature, is the only entity that can, can do anything about drones. So that means that if Portland City Council wanted to say, hey, we in the local level, we may not be, you know, a situation on Mount Hood where we have to go do a search and rescue, we don't want drones flying over Portland. We don't want them crashing potentially in people's houses, etc. Portland can't do that. Portland now can't pass a local ordinance, which mm -hmm. I think is, is terrible. It really is. Yeah. Um, yeah, because yeah, my view always is the democracy works best when it's local. Yeah. And so the legislature just took that away from us. They did. Again. They, 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 and, and this is you know, certainly not the only thing that the legislature has preempted it, local governments from working on. Uh, in turn, th there are a whole bunch of things in the bill governing uh, law enforcement use. Uh, there's Law enforcement will need to have probable cause before they can fly a drone to to do surveillance on people, uh, which and which means they need to get a warrant. Most of the time, there are some exceptions in the bill. Uh, you know, if a crime is about to be committed or is being committed, you know, they they can use a drone. Or if somebody uh, thinks there's a or crime if, about or somebody to thinks, there's, yeah. So you know, there's a lot of wiggle room there. I'm sure we're going to have some interesting legal battles between you know the criminal defense attorney saying this information was picked up by a drone and and they didn't have probable cause to start uh -huh. the search with the drone. I mean, that's, that's inevitably going to come up. We're going to start to get some court decisions. Uh -huh. uh, we're, so you we're see yourself involved in that process somewhere? Yeah, I, yep. I, I, um, I am sure that, um, you know, at our law firm, I work at my dad's law firm, Koforian McDougal, and uh, my dad and his law partner, Mark McDougal, have been fighting the good fight combined for 50 years, 55 years. Um, and we... We don't get involved too much with criminal stuff. You know, every once in a while we'll have one or two things we do, but we mostly deal with uh, the civil side. So when people get injured, hurt, wronged, um, civil liberties stuff, we deal with a lot of police brutality cases, mm -hmm. uh, stuff like that. Um, and but but I do see the potential uh, for a citizen flying a drone. Uh, the drone crashes uh, into somebody else's property. Uh, there is a provision in this new law which gives treble damages, which means triple the value. So if someone crashed into your house and it was, it caused 20000 in damages, you could ask for treble damages. And that's basically a punishment to try to prevent uh, oh, people uh -huh. um, from, from crashing drones or causing uh -huh. a trespass with uh -huh. drones. But I thought, the very, I, I thought it was not well articulated in the bill uh, how you would get to the civil side. Uh, and to actually bring a case because the way it's drafted now, you have to have someone fly something over your property uh, 400 feet or closer, and you have to provide notice to the person that you didn't want them to be doing it. Well, first of oh. all, some of these drones are the size of bees. So how are you going to know if somebody's flying a bee-shaped creature you know, uh -huh. <laughs> uh, up no. there? That's A. And B... Even if you do see somebody flying a drone, how are you gonna know who you know who who's in uh, control who of it? Right. Yeah, uh -huh. how are you ever gonna provide notice? To, uh, right. to, I mean, so it's totally uh, and maybe, utterly impractical. Yeah, maybe there should be a, a, a uh, an allowance to publish a notice in the newspaper that you've had a, you've noticed a drone and that you don't want in general people to, to do that again. The, 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 <laughs> they, they need a better system. <laughs> yeah. Uh -huh. I, the, the, the one thing I will say, no, run short on time. The one thing I will say is that. The, the State Aviation uh, Board has been the appointed entity for all the law enforcement and public entities to register their drones with. So that should be public information. We should be able to send a, a FOIA, Freedom of Information Request, to that department down the road once this gets moving and find out who has drones and for what purpose those drones were used. We should mm -hmm. be able to get that. But why in this bill is there nothing about private citizens? Yeah. Nothing about and, private citizens. And when you say private citizens, you're also call it, talking about corporations. Absolutely, right. yeah. Right. Citizens and corporations. Sadly, yeah. our, our, our Supreme Court, U.S. Supreme Court, has been conflating uh, citizens and uh, private corporations uh, yes, way right. too closely recently. Uh, right. That's probably a topic for another show. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yes, we, we definitely have talked about that. We'll talk about that some more. Right, yeah. 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 So anything else about that bill in particular that uh, is of concern to you? Well, yeah, I, 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 I like the fact that they've set up a Department uh, of Aviation registry uh, for the for the private 
uh, for, for the public um, drones, because that way we can at least find out what's really happening. But uh -huh. I, I think that there needs to be some sort of, if you're going to give private citizens drones, which I'm totally against, but if you're going to do it, um, then I think you need to have some sort of a registry like you were talking about, and you, you, the, the person needs to state their public purpose for why they're going to be having mm -hmm. a, a drone and, wh and what they'd like to do with it. I mean, I, I, I just don't believe, you know, there's nothing in, in the Constitution that says, you know, right to bear drones. Um, so, <laughs> right. <laughs> you know, I, I, so maybe that's how people would challenge this eventually would be to arm the drones and then say that they have a right to arm drones. You know, they have a right to uh, bear arms, there, right? there's, there's endless yeah. possibilities. Uh, yeah. I, I'm sorry. Our time is up. No problem. We're creating the Wild West uh, uh, out there with like drones. Right. Yes, right. Thank you very much. It was a pleasure, David. Thanks okay. for having me on. All right. You bet. All right. Our guest today has been Jason Kafori, a trial lawyer and an organizer with the Oregon Progressive Party. Learn more about the Oregon Progressive Party at www.progparty.org. The Alliance for Democracy celebrates the Oregon legislature passed HJM6, calling on our U.S. representatives and senators to send us a 28th constitutional amendment to end corporate personhood. And we call on all Oregonians and Americans to let your U.S. representative and U.S. senators know that not only did the legislature do this, but that you support that position and you want them to get to work on it. All Americans should contact their U.S. representative and senators to express their support for amending the Constitution to do three things. And this is really important, three things. The amendment must overturn the Supreme Court's Citizens United decision. It must eliminate corporate personhood, meaning that constitutional rights should only belong to flesh and blood human beings and not to our corporate creations. And then the third thing is that money equals free speech doctrine must also be overturned because we know that money is property and that property can and should be subject to regulation. So we do call on folks and we hope that you will contact your U.S. representative and senators to send to us a 28th constitutional amendment. I want to thank Roger Bates, Janet Morris, and Tom Thomas for their volunteer time getting us on the air. And thank you to all of you for watching. I hope that we'll see you again next week. Bye.